Now, how beautiful was that, huh? All right, I think they're beautiful, right? One body, many parts. Don't ever be afraid to step foot in the Jordan. Let the Holy Spirit do some work in your lives. Hope that prompts you to get active. Serve the Lord. Amen. What a beautiful job. One body, many parts. How's everybody doing this morning, all right? Excellent. Right now that we're in church, right? Whew. It certainly does get challenging out there, doesn't it, for us Christians? All right, we're going to continue our fruit of the Spirit message. How's everybody doing tonight, today with the fruit? How about everybody doing with their gentleness? Was everybody gentle this week? Were you being gentle or were you being Gentiles this week? Huh? <laughs> All right, it's just challenging, right? Only the Holy Spirit can do this. We try to do it in the flesh, we fail miserably. All right, let us turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start there this morning. As always, the Holy Spirit will be taken over as I go into these scriptures. It'll no longer be me, it'll be the Lord speaking to you. So prepare your minds and your hearts to receive the message the Spirit's trying to say to the church this morning. Amen? We are using the black Bibles in the pews, and there is a blue card to help you get to the scriptures fast as you can, as we are going to be going through them. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4. Well, we have to start in verse 1, obviously. You got me, Mary. But as always, I could go forward. <laughs> we'll see where the Spirit leads us, amen? Okay, Ephesians 4. Unity in the body of Christ. One thing that the churches are lacking is unity and sad. Because the Bible is not the owner's manual in all the churches, but it is in this one. And we're going to be the example. Therefore, verse 1, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Each and every one of us, Jesus said, nobody can come to the Father unless the Father draws them to him. So you all got drew to the Father, you became a believer, and it's an honor to be called by God. And it says in verse 2, sometimes be humble. Oh, wait a minute, it's a typo. My, my, my book says always. Sorry. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binded yourselves together with peace. So we have to fight to stay in the spirit. We come to church, you know, sometimes the devil attacks us all the way till we get here, fighting and arguing or getting frustrated. So when we come to church, he wants us to be in our flesh. So we have to fight to subdue that and come in the spirit so we could all be in what? Unity and love and joy and peace. Can I get an amen here? That's something that we have to practice. For there is one body, one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. We just seen some gifts being practiced this morning, right? They had a beautiful voice, right? The gift. It was like the angels were singing this morning. It was beautiful. It was flawless. It was flawless. That's all I heard was the angels. Because in the spirit, it's flawless. Then it says, however, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended which clearly means that Christ also de descended into our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself as he's building his kingdom. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles 
and the prophets, the foundational gifts, the evangelists that operate today, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church. What's my responsibility? To equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. That's what my job is, to teach you his ways so we can build up his church and do his work. Can I get a big amen here? All right. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. Why? When you're rooted and grounded in the Bible, you will not be shaken or twisted by anything else. Can I get an amen? That's why we offer that here, to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation so you don't get tripped up by any kind of false teachings. Can I get an amen here? Then we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind. You'll know when somebody's a fraud. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. See, the devil is the father of lies, and he loves to put half-truths in there so we believe some of it in the spirit, and then he gets our flesh involved to stay with it so we can keep our flesh alive instead of killing it and becoming like Christ. Can I get an amen here? That's what the devil does. We're here to crucify our flesh, not what? Glorify it. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the church, head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. This church is growing into the image of Christ, which is love. We come together, we unity in the spirit, we don't pick at each other, we don't tear each other down, we don't find fault with anybody. We come here in unity of the spirit. Can I get an amen? amen. And we all get along and we grow together. Because all of us are what? God's little children, and we're all equal in his eyes. So no one has the right to judge anybody else here. That's God's job, amen? In the spirit, we're all perfect. Amen. All right. All right. So it tells us now, I'm just going to go a little bit further. It tells us to live as children of light. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they're hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they close their minds and harden their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception instead all right so we throw off the old life right now instead let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes put on your new nature created to be like god truly righteous and holy can i get an amen so we have to make a choice every day to what throw that sinful nature off and what walk in unity of the spirit that's a choice that we have to do every day and that ties right into the message we're talking about with what all the fruits of the spirit and we're going to talk about this Fruit this morning, the last one. Does anybody know what it is? How many of us are great with self-control? Boy, we need a lot of work in this area. I started studying this. I said, wow, we got a long way to go, church. But that's okay. That's okay. Listen, we're all growing, and it ain't going to stop till we go home to be with him. Three steps forward, two steps back. Grace and mercy covers it. We keep moving forward. How about an amen here? Stop beating yourself up knowing, look, we came into this world sinners. And to kill that sin off is going to take some time and a lot of work. God's going to overhaul us. 
<laughs> Anybody ever watch that show Overhauling? With the cars? They have to, to overhaul a car. They have to what? Tear the whole thing down, all the way back to its bare bones again, put it on a rotisserie, sandblast the chassis, and start from scratch. So that's what he's doing with us. He's sandblasting us. That's what he's doing. He's blasting all the impurities out of us, and he's starting fresh. That's why he says you've got to become like a child again and learn all over again. And that's what he's doing. One day at a time, one process at a time, Christ is living in you, giving you the power and the desire to do what pleases him. All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's start there this morning. Okay. First. I can't hear you. All right, verse 22 of Galatians 5. This is what the Holy Spirit produces. Oh, did I say Ephesians? Oh, I'm sorry, Galatians. All right. Thank you. I get carried away sometimes. Yeah. It was just in Ephesians, huh? Can I, can I have some grace? Thank you. <laughs> See, I'm not perfect. I'm just like you. My mother used to call me a shakwa. That's your shakwa. Yeah, you've been called that? Yeah, me too. Strambalone. You forget your head if it wasn't good, aren't you? I hear all them things from my mother. But she loved me. God rest her soul. She was making me lunch till I was 50. And still buying me socks and underwear. <laughs> she was awesome. And I took it. Believe me, I didn't, I didn't argue with it. I went and get the lunch. Boy, could she put some love into that. She could make anything taste good. Oh, an old Italian family. They just loved each other to death. I argued all the time. But everybody was always there for each other. Amen? And sitting, and sitting down for dinner was a real... It was, a, it was something that we practiced. It was family ties, family gathering. Something that's lost its flavor in America. Which I say, shut everything down on a Sunday. Church is open. Then go home, be with your families, and share a nice dinner together. And get to know each other again. And put the cell phones away. And shut the TV off. And get back to the roots of our country. How about an amen there? There was a time, like I said, on Sundays when nothing was open. You couldn't even get gas. Nothing was open. Nothing. Church was open. The devil worms his way in, right? Starts making all things happen right at church service so people can't come. That's what he does. All right. Verse 22. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, is this us, have nailed the passions and desires of this sinful nature to his cross and crucified him there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So we all have to understand, even though we're spirit, we still have an opportunity to what? Be jealous, provoke one another, and still walk in the flesh. We still have to make that choice. Can I get an amen? Every day we have to make a choice to walk in the spirit. Or else it's not going to happen. Before we get into the details, it's essential to remember that the fruit of the Spirit is not simply a group of moral commands. It's not nine different ways to live a better life, although they certainly do result in a better life when they're present. It is not just a call to live an upright good life. It is so much more. One of the most interesting and misoften understood aspects of the fruit of the Spirit is that the Bible teaches that it's one fruit with many characteristics. How about an amen here? Amen. Many characteristics. The Bible tells us it's one fruit with nine flavors. The presence of all of these characteristics or flavors provides evidence that a person is being controlled by the Holy Spirit. 
To put it in the most obvious terms, the fruit of the Spirit is the result of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. When we come to Christ, the Holy Spirit fills us and he begins to produce good fruit in us. He begins to work in us, sanctifying us, and making us more like Jesus. As we pursue God and follow after him with our whole heart, the Holy Spirit continues to produce more and more of good fruit in us. How about a big amen there? So he's what? Working on us. We're all a work in progress, right? Sometimes we're producing good fruit. Sometimes we're producing bad fruit. But one thing is for sure, the Lord says he's going to continue his work in us until it's finished. And thank God for that, that he never leaves us or gives up on us like we give up on ourselves and others. How about a big amen there? So don't give up on your loved ones that are struggling. Don't give up on yourself who's struggling. Because God is working in you. Giving you the power and the desire to do what pleases him. How about a big amen there? Don't ever give up. The Bible says it, right? Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. All right, so the next one is self-control. It is the capstone virtue of the spirit, okay? And it is the key to your spiritual integrity. It is the virtue that determines how effectively you build all the other spiritual virtues into your life. Without self-control, you will not operate with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness. Self-discipline or self-control in the Greek, here we go, <laughs> is egritia. I said this right, egritia. I looked it up, went over and over and over, and I wrote it in there. Egritia, which means the self-discipline or self-control to exercise power over yourself. It is keeping yourself under control. It is the spirit-empowered self-mastery over your inner desires, thoughts, actions, and words. It is the cornerstone. It is the cornerstone spiritual virtue in your battle against the old sin nature. How about a big amen there? How many of us have trouble with self-control in certain areas? You don't have to raise your hand because I know we all do. <laughs> sometimes we can control ourselves good in one area and sometimes we have no self-control in others. Right? All of us. <laughs> I believe this is one of the great spiritual issues of our generation. It is possibly the issue of our time. It is a choice, a decision you must repeatedly make. Self-control and self-discipline are crucial to live in a God-honoring, spirit-led life. Both are essential. Not only to godly living, but also to accomplishing much of anything in life as this vice or virtue spills over into many other areas of life. We cannot pick and choose the areas of life in which we will exercise self-control. In fact, a lack of self-control and self-discipline opens the door to the variety of sins. When we seldom say no to our desires and emotions, we become more vulnerable to associated sins. Thus, the lack of self-control be mean one of the more secret sins believers struggle with. What is self-control? Listen now, is everybody with me so far here? Because self-control is not willpower. You have to understand that. Willpower is of the flesh. Willpower is not doing something that you want to do. See, the more control you give over to God, the more self-control he gives over to you. You see, self-control is, is losing the desire for it. So you don't desire it anymore. Can I get an amen? It's not simply grinding your teeth saying, I want it, but I'm not going to do it. It's not wanting it anymore. You're wanting the things of God over the things of the flesh. Can I get an amen? Totally different thing. Because willpower... You still want it. You're just not doing it. Self-control is you don't want it anymore. 
So you control your mastery over your flesh saying, that's not who I am anymore. I am dead to that life. I am a new creation in Christ and I no longer desire them things anymore. And you fight against it. Can I get an amen here? In the spirit, there is none of that. We don't want any of that in the spirit. All right. Thus, a lack of self-control is a secret. So what is it? It is a government. Now listen now. I'm going to explain what it is. It is a governance or prudent control of one's desires, cravings, impulses, emotions, and passions. It is saying no when we should say no. It is moderation in the legitimate desires and activities and absolute restraint in areas that are clearly sinful. Biblical self-control covers every area of life and requires an unceasing conflict with the passions of the flesh that wage war against our souls. Can I get a big amen here? Go with me to Genesis chapter 4. This is where it all began. Now, if you don't know where Genesis is, just go to the beginning. We all remember the story about Cain and Abel. I mean, that's out there everywhere. So in Genesis 4, for the sake of time, I'm going to get right to the point. Of Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. God's asking Cain a question after he killed his brother out of jealousy. Genesis chapter 4, look at verse 6. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, watch out. Then watch out. Why? Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. You see it? It's seeking to control every believer. But we have to what? Subdue it and master it. That is the whole key to your Christian life, mastering your flesh, because your flesh is not going anywhere when you become a Christian. Have you not noticed that? When you get angry or things don't go your way or you get irritated, how easy your flesh comes back, even right after you came to church, because it's still in us. It's like a virus. It lays dormant, but then when it wants to come out, boy, it comes out with a vengeance. And we have to know when to say no to it and subdue it. Go with me to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to move around this morning. I want you to see this. We've got a couple of verses in 1 Peter, so I'll give you a break. I love the pages turning. Keep them turning. The owner's manual. First Peter chapter 2. Go with me to verse 11. Peter's going to talk about the conduct of God's people in the midst of suffering. Verse 11. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents in foreigners. See, when you get saved, you're an alien here. You're no longer a resident here. You know that your residency is in heaven now. It says, I warn you as temporary residents in foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Now look at verse 12. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Why? Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. How about a big amen there? It says to be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Why? 
Because they're watching us Christians. Have you not noticed that? You tell people you're a Christian, they're looking for every flaw that they can accuse you of. They throw the Christian card at us all the time. So what does it say? Be careful to live properly so they can't. Right, now go with me to 1 Peter 1, verse 13. Just back up a couple of Back up a chap. Are we practicing self-control, church, when we're not here? Are we looking at our neighbors and seeing what they think of us, what they see in us as Christians? Do they know there's a difference in you? Do they see a difference in you? That's the question. That I know you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Peter 1. Look at verse 13. Yeah. So a call to holy living. So prepare your minds for action... In exercise, what does it say? Exercise self-control. What is exercising self-control? What is exercise? You go to the gym, what is exercise? What do you do? You get the weight and you move it, you do this and you exercise. So it's telling you to exercise self-control. So what does that mean? That means you have to practice it. You have to, it has to be in the forefront of your mind saying, I have to watch what I'm thinking, what I'm saying, and what I'm doing. Not watching what other people are thinking they and, and doing, what I'm thinking and saying and doing as a representative of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen here? It, we have to practice that. Now listen, look what it says. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Now look at verse 14. It says something very important in verse 14. So you must live as God's... Is that... Is that, is that, it says you must. It doesn't say it's an option. I don't know what people have been teaching in churches, but it's not an option. It's not an option, church. It says you must live as God's obedient children, and it tells us, because this could happen, don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You did not know any better then, but now, you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. So he's saying, you're informed now. Now it's time to what? Do what I ask you to do. Can I get an amen here? It's not just go to church, live the way you want and done, and I'm going to heaven. No, it says you must live as obedient children of God. That's what the scriptures say. It's not me saying this. It's what the Bible is saying. Not what churches are saying. Not what denominations are saying. It's what the Bible is saying. You understand? This is what we go by. The Bible. It says in verse 15, you must be holy in everything you do. And that's what the sanctification process is. Just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the heavenly father you, to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So does it matter what you do after salvation? You bet your life it does. You will be judged for everything you do after salvation. And don't ever forget it, church. He will judge you and reward you according to what you do. So you must live. Look what it says. You must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. So he says, you, you know what the problem is? No fear of God anymore. People have forgot to fear God. Even Christians are forgetting to fear God. Do you realize 
the good Lord giveth and the good Lord taketh away, he can snuff us out just like that. He doesn't have to answer to you. He doesn't have to do anything. He's, you belong to him. He owns you. Just like the mafia. Once you're in, you're in. You can't get out. Thank God for that. Thank God. See, but it's not like the mafia. They kill you and you're dead. No, when you, when you die, you go home to be with him. You see, there's a difference. There's a better life to come. He's preparing us for that. He says in verse, look what it says. He called us temporary residents. Are you living here like it's your temporary resident? Or are you making a strong foundation here saying, this is where I'm staying. I'm building my castle down here. When you become a believer, your castle is in heaven. And you, what you build down here, when life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus Christ will last. Everything else you, cut, you, you do down here stays down here. Everything you do for Jesus comes with you. So what are you living for, church? It says God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from the answer. Why is it an empty life? Because you could have the riches. You could have everything. And at the end of the day, you still come up empty. You have still no fulfillment in you. Now what? What's next? People have millions and billions of dollars. Why do they commit suicide after? Why do they feel so empty? Because they try to build everything down here that doesn't produce what it, they thought it was going to produce. It doesn't give them contentment. It's always the next project. I got a little example. I have a friend of mine at work. His name is Jason. Really good friend of mine. Real good kid. His mother's a devout Christian. Out of the blue, uh, it was a Thursday Thursday um, afternoon, I just, out of the blue, I don't know what compelled me to say this, but I asked him how his mother was doing. This is, this is, this is the Holy Spirit. And um, he said, uh, not good, Pastor. Um, you know, they found a lot of tumors, some on her liver, some on her lungs, one on her brain. And, uh, you know, I don't know. And I said, you know what, I'm going to pray. So I went in the mixing room. I work in the paint department. I went in the mixing room and I got on my knees and I prayed for her. And I asked the Lord, Lord, she's one of yours. Show your miracle through this, Lord. Show your miracle, heal her, Lord. Show. Show, because the son is a, he's on the fence with the, because his mother's a Christian. He's on the fence with Christianity because what he sees. He came up to me Friday afternoon and said, you know, he said, I don't know what you did, he said. But every tumor my mother had is benign. Wow. Right? But he said, listen, the, the thing, that's not, that's, it wasn't none of me. The thing of it was, he attested to the prayer. He said, I don't know what you did, but my mother's tumors are benign. So he came up to me and he knew that something that I did made that happen by praying to the Lord. And guess what? That's one step closer for him to become a believer. That's one step closer to getting his life. And, and I don't know, that, that was the Lord compelled me to ask him how his mother was. I, I haven't talked about his mother in, in years. And it was amazing. It was amazing how he attested that to what I did and prayed. And I didn't heal what God did. But I went and prayed. I said, Lord, show your power. Show your miraculous sign so he can become a believer. You see? Because what he sees in Christianity, he doesn't see that. He sees what? Hypocrisy. And people living for themselves all this and calling themselves Christians. He doesn't see the power of God working through people. So he has what? Doubts. He says, what's the difference? But then he saw it, you see? He saw it in action. To prayer. Do you have enough faith to pray like that? Because the Bible says you can move mountains with prayers. And you always got to make sure that you're not hindering the prayer to live a godly life while you're praying. Because you could be the hindrance of why it's not getting answered. Don't ever think. It says what godly life you should live. So if you're praying for people, make sure it's not you that's holding it back. I just figured I'd share that with you because it's powerful. It's powerful. When you live for Jesus, you live right, you do the best you can, he hears your prayers. And that's his choice to answer it or not, 
But I guess what? It's not my fault why I didn't. See, if God said it's not my will, it's not my will. But as long as it wasn't me that hindered it, all glory goes to him. Amen? All right. All right, this self-control, listen now, is dependent on the influence and enablement of the Holy Spirit. It requires continual exposure of our mind to the Word of God and continual prayer for the Holy Spirit to give us both the desire and power to exercise self-control. We might say that self-control is not controlled by oneself through one's own willpower, but rather control of oneself through the power of the Holy Spirit. Go with me to Philippians chapter 2. Just getting warmed up here. Because everything I'm talking to you about is biblical. Because Paul's, um, James said it in James, the prayer of a righteous person has a lot of power. Elijah was just as human as anybody else. But when he prayed, it didn't rain for three years. Why? Because he was in God's will. He was living obedient. Now, look at... Um, Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 12. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Shine brightly for Christ. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. Apostle Paul speaking to the Philippians. And now he's speaking to, he's talking to us in Greystone. And now that I'm away, it's even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Do you see it? What are you going to work hard for? Look, and you don't work hard to get saved. You work hard to show the results of your salvation. Can I get an amen? It says work hard to show the results of your salvation. Right? Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Why? For God is working in you. Look what it says now. Giving you what? The desire and the power to do what pleases him. Can I get an amen? He's the one that does the work. Now, look what it says in verse 14. You ready to hear this now? Do everything without complaining and arguing. How's everybody doing with that one? Huh? Do everything without complaining and arguing. Why? So that no one can criticize you. The unbelieving world is criticizing Christians for this very reason. Because we still complain and we still argue with each other. Can I get an amen here? You see it? So that no one can criticize you. We are getting bombarded with criticism from the unbelieving world. Because why? Nobody is putting this into practice in living an upright life for Jesus. Because they don't think that they have to. It says to show the result of your salvation is the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. That's the fruit. Fruit, 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 fruit. Do you go out full of fruit or do you go out full of flesh? What's the flesh? Anger, bitterness, rage, complaining, arguing, backbiting. Gossiping, stabbing each other in the back, even Christians who say, Oh, I love Jesus. Why well, you're sticking a knife in his brother's back? How do you feel about doing that? Does it, does it bother you? Do you get convicted when you do it? Or do you just keep doing it and say, No, I'm, it's okay. No, God hates that. It's one of the biggest sins in the church gossip and slander. Never mind the drunkenness and all the outward things. Those are easy to get rid of. I'm talking about the sins inside of us. When we talk about people and complain about people and backbite people and call ourselves believers in Jesus Christ and we worship him with love. What is he saying? Hypocrite. Get rid of the log in your eye. before you can, Get rid of the two by four in your eye before you can get rid of the speck in your friend's eye. Can't get any men here. He says, if you're off and you get the off, go make it right with your friends. Before you come to church. Then you'll be honoring your father the right way. Go make it right with people. Christians. 
It's a loose word these days, isn't it? You'll know my people by their... Oh, well, what's the fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. Not anger, bitterness, rage, anger, and resentment. That's not fruit of the Spirit. That's you. Jesus didn't have to die for you to do that. You were doing good with, without him dying. He died so you can stop doing it. Do you practice that? Do you try? Do you at least give it an effort to say when you get up in the morning, Lord, I want to live for you today, not for me. Help me, Lord. Help me to stop playing church. Time is getting near here. Help me to bring other people into the kingdom. You got saved to bring others into the kingdom. You know that, right? All of us did. We got saved to bring others to the kingdom. But how can we bring others to the kingdom if we're not in the kingdom? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I say? And it takes a lot of self-control to do this. So maybe I ought to stay on this one for a while. More than a week. It's going to take more than a week to practice this. And I got a lot to say about it. Because it's not being practiced in church, and it's not being proclaimed in church, and it's not being taught in church. You realize you come to church, you're in school now. You're in school of the Holy Spirit. The owner's manual is being presented to you. The right way to live. All the wrong way you used to live has to go. And now you're living a new life. One day at a time till he comes back. You realize that's why he saved you, right? Okay. Now look what it says. Before we close. Do everything without complaining and arguing. Why? So no one can criticize you. Now it's telling us to live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of what? Crooked and perverse people. How can we shine like bright lights if we're right involved with crooked and perverse people? How can people see a difference in us if we're not shining something different when we go out there, being courteous, giving people a break, not holding anything against them, loving our enemies, not talking about each other, abstaining from things that you know are not godly. Whatever controls you, it says you're a, you're a slave to whatever controls you. Paul said he was a slave to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ controlled him. What's controlling you? Is Jesus Christ controlling you? Or is the idols of the world controlling you? That's the question. Can I get a big amen here? The world's full of crooked and perverse people, and unfortunately, so is the church. First, you have to catch the fish, right? The evangelist goes and catches them, and I come in, you come in, and I clean them. See, everybody has their own job. You don't, you come in that way, but you do not stay that way. Can I get an amen here? You don't stay that way. You become like Christ. That's why you're in school. See, to give up that life and to start a new one. That's what it's all about. That's why you're here. Starting to live a new life. Not just coming to church to do your duty, it's coming to church to honor your father who saved you, who brought you into this world for a purpose because he loves you. Because let me just tell you something about self-control. It carries with it a negative connotation. That's why, you see? Something we rely on, right? Why do we rely on it? To what? To complete our most difficult or least favorite tasks, okay? But self-discipline and self-control should be seen positively as something that promotes joy in much of the same way as a train is only free when it is confined to the railroad tracks in general. We discipline ourselves to avoid the negative consequences of a lack of discipline. We know that we will suffer if we don't exercise, if we don't manage our finances, if we never crawl out of bed. If these things were pleasant, they wouldn't require much effort, right? We don't need discipline to eat chocolate, but not to eat chocolate. That's what we need discipline. Discipline associated with what? Self-denial. And it is not surprising that it tends to have negative connotations. 
But sometimes it really just comes down to how we frame it because discipline is equally important when it comes to life's pleasant tasks. We don't just need to discipline ourselves away from unpleasantness, but toward joy. Discipline allows us to picture desirable outcomes, to form a plan to get there, to take the necessary steps, and to experience the joys we long for. Discipline is good because discipline delivers joy. When we associate discipline only with avoidance of negative outcomes, we rob ourselves of a means God uses to promote our joy and ultimately our joy in Him. Last scripture, Titus chapter 2. Then we're going to close. Titus chapter 2. So this week, we're going to practice self control. And say, how can I make sure that they do? Well, every number I got on my phone, I'm texting it this, this week. Don't forget the text. Don't forget the self-control. Don't forget. Because why do we forget the things that are good for us and never forget the things that are bad? We always remember to do the wrong thing. We never have any problem with that. Remembering that. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Oh, sometimes the messages are hard, right? But sometimes good medicine goes down hard. But it brings a good effect. It brings a healing. And God happened to hide on my forehead and say, you just preach it. Because you're, 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 you're mentioning me. It's not you, it's me. If they get anything against what you're saying, they got a problem with me, not you, John. So I say it. Look at verse um, 11 of Titus, verse 2. Chapter 2. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we work forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. Now look what it says. He gave his life. Why did he die for us? Listen why he died for us. He gave us his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. And look what it says. You must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them. You have the authority to correct them when necessary, so don't let anyone disregard what you say. The Bible tells me that I have to teach these things and encourage you to do them. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Because God, I'm here to honor and glorify God. I, I'm, I'm accountable to him for what comes out of this pulpit. What I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. You taught them the hard stuff, the stuff that will make them change. Amen. Well, thank you for letting me share that. I'm going to call the yes to take up the collection, and we're going to close. Remember, self-control.